Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. In September 2013, Renuka and I were headed to Cape Town, South Africa. Whenever we leave, we always ask our nieces, Marsha and Kara, what they would like to have as gifts. Kara was pretty clear about her gift. Bring me an elephant, she said emphatically. Now, Kara was just four at the time, and an elephant seemed like a pretty plausible gift. She wasn't taking no for an answer, even when we told her that an elephant might not fit in her house. But then I brought up a point that stopped her cold in her tracks. After she heard what I had to say, she wasn't keen on the elephant anymore. So what did I tell her? I said, the elephant is a big animal and all big animals poo. The larger the animal, the greater the volume of poo. Kara didn't need much convincing. She wanted nothing to do with the elephant or the poo for that matter. And this is the battle that we have to deal with every single day. We all want our businesses to grow bigger than ever before. What we don't think about is the poo. The bigger the business, the bigger the poo. And in business terms, you could call the poo tolerance. You need an enormous amount of tolerance to keep that business going, which is why people struggle so much when they get into a business. They don't see the factor of tolerance needed to keep the business going. So let's look at this factor of tolerance. Let's look at three shades of tolerance, shall we? The tolerance for failure the tolerance to learn, and the tolerance for the long haul. In August 2015, a musical made its debut on Broadway. It wasn't just any old musical. A few months later, in February of that year, the off-Broadway engagement was totally sold out. And in 2016 itself, this musical received 16 Tony nominations and it won 11. That musical goes by the name of Hamilton. It's a hip-hop musical about the life of the American founding father Alexander Hamilton and the American Revolution. Now, the musical's producer, Jeffrey Seller, he is passionate about the need for tolerance. People don't have the tolerance, says Sella, who's seen more than his share of failures. The tolerance for anxiety, for fear, for bewilderment, and mostly for pain. In the book Originals by Adam Grant, There is a list of high-profile failures. Take, for example, William Shakespeare. You're likely to have heard about William Shakespeare's work in plays such as Macbeth, King Lear, and Othello. But you might never have heard of Timon of Athens or All's Well That Ends Well. Those last two, Timon of Athens and All's Well That Ends Well, they rank among the worst of his plays. They have been considered to be completely underbaked. But that's not unusual, is it? A writer does bad work and then produces better work as time goes on. What's interesting about those plays is that he produced them in the same five-year window as some of his best plays. Shakespeare is known for his amazing plays, but most people fail to realize that he turned out a grinding 37 plays and 154 sonnets. 
his tolerance for getting into the heart of failure and then getting out of it was, as it turns out, consistent with any successful person. Hamilton bakes in incredible success today, but his producer, Jeffrey Seller, clearly defines success through the eyes of failure. And he does so quite eloquently in this interview with Peter Bregman. Success feels good. Success is in its own way easy. It's easy on your kishkas. It's easy uh, um, on my stomach and on my heart. It is also true that failure, the, the feelings that failure evokes are so much worse than the positive feelings that success evokes. And I guess, you know, I've heard that, I've heard of tennis players who say, I never feel as good winning as badly I feel when I'm losing. And then he goes on to talk about cherry picking and why we shouldn't cherry pick our projects. A, we must not cherry pick because it will never get it right. <laughs> and if I lose money in one show and then say, oh, I better not do it in the next, I'm going to be in big trouble if the next one's the hit. I have to, I, I'll give you an example. I, I was doing this, um, I did an opera on Broadway in 2002. We did La Boheme on Broadway in Italian. And it was a beautiful production conceived and directed by the filmmaker Baz Luhrmann. And I had persuaded this group of Korean investors who I had done some other business with, to invest a whopping million dollars. They lose 900 of the million. I ask them to invest in this little show with puppets called Avenue Q. They pass. Avenue Q goes on to make over $30 million of profit for all of its investors. They cherry-picked. And they used the fear that losing money in La Boheme generated to guide their next decision. Picasso didn't cherry pick. When we look at Picasso's greatest paintings, what we don't see is the sheer volume that's almost too well hidden. By the time he died in 1973, Pablo Picasso had done over 1,800 paintings, 1,200 sculptures, 2,800 ceramics, and a staggering 12,000 drawings. If, on the other hand, we look at Leonardo da Vinci, we see that only 15 or 16 of his paintings seem to exist. And yet, in his surviving notebooks alone, we have a staggering 7,000 detailed drawings. It's called Elephant Poo. If you want to get the elephant, you have to get the poo as well. And success, the success that so many of us crave is just a ton of fighting through a mountain range of poo. In reality, success is far less frequent than failure. The tolerance for anxiety, for fear, for bewilderment and pain, that's what we need. But what's really happening when we get into this failure zone? What's really happening is that we are rooting out the mistakes. Talent or success is just a reduction of errors. Mozart is known for a few great works, but he barreled through 600 of them before his death. Beethoven was no slouch either. He produced over 650 in his lifetime. Mahatma Gandhi tried an endless number of ways to get the British out of India. When he finally hit upon the jackpot, the salt march or the dandy march in 1930, that would set this momentum for Indian independence. That tolerance for fear is the greatest one of them all. But it doesn't stop there. We need the tolerance to learn and to learn progressively. This takes us to our second part, which is the tolerance to learn. In the 1960s, a woman called Betty Cronin, a bacteriologist, invented something that would change the life of women in the West forever. Food preparation at that point in time 
took the average U.S. woman between 16 to 24 hours a week. And then along came the TV dinner. Instead of slaving over the stove for hours every week, there was this packaged meal, this prepackaged meal that could be served, and in a matter of minutes, everyone was eating. And today, we are at the point where we can get all sorts of packaged and prepackaged food in almost every supermarket. In short, everything is driven by a need for speed. When we learn, we have a similar need for speed. I had little tolerance for slow learning. When I started out, I wanted to learn everything as quickly as possible. And to help me achieve this goal, I bought a speed reading course, like one of the super speed reading courses. I wasn't going to be satisfied with this conventional speed reading system. I wanted a whole lot more, which is why I got this thing called a photo reading course. To read, you simply had to look at the book and flip page after page in rapid succession. From what I could remember, you could turn about 40 to 60 pages in a minute, and all the information would be neatly stored in your head. I know, you're probably laughing at me because the system sounds so ridiculous, and it may or may not be ridiculous. It's hard to measure what you cannot remember, but after years of trying to speed things up, I realized one very important fact. I needed to slow down. I needed to have a higher tolerance for learning. So what is a higher tolerance for learning? In my opinion, it's a method of slowing down rather than speeding up. When I get a book, I'll very rarely read the book from cover to cover. Well, I will get cover to cover, but I won't start and try to finish the book. Instead, what I'll do is I'll reach for my moleskin diary and a pen, and then I'll make notes or I'll make mind maps. And not every book makes the cut, but when I get a good one, like Originals by Adam Grant, then I'll read the book, I'll listen to the audio version, I'll make notes, I'll write articles, and right now in the podcast, that's what I'm telling you. So why go through all of this trouble? It's the opposite of the TV dinner. It's like a chef that lavishes time and effort to get a meal ready for dinner. It allows me to get to the very core of what's being stated in the book. Or at least, that's what I think. Now, my memory is like a sieve. I can't remember as much as I think I should be remembering. So I'll go back to listen to an audiobook, and I'll go back after many years, and then I'll find that it almost seems like a brand new book. I understood the book at the time, and I understood the book with great depth, and then I'm astounded that I hadn't figured out what the author was really saying. So that earlier reading was completely different. And this level of tolerance... This tolerance for reading is not common because it seems so very trendy to say, I've read so many books. To this day, if you go to the About Us page on the Psychotactics website, you'll see how I proudly mention that I used to read 100 books a year or that I read 100 books a year. Well, that's hardly possible at this slow pace, is it? Don't get me wrong. I crave books. Just like someone longing for a great meal, I look at all the books that I've missed and there is this definite sense of regret. Even so, it's important to have a tolerance for slow learning. And with slow learning, it's also important to cross-pollinate your learning, which in turn makes it even slower. This cross-pollination means that you're reading a series of books that often have little resemblance to each other. At this moment, I'm reading The Man Who Knew Infinity, a book about Srinivas Ramanujan, and we'll get to know him better in the next section. There's also this book by Adam Grant called Originals, and a book specifically about the David statue, which is sculpted by Michelangelo. While pouring through these books at a snail space, I'll watch videos about Tomo hairline currents and ponder over the information I get about high and low entropy. These are all subjects that I'm interested in. And what happens is this whole mixture of thoughts and ideas. All of this learning, it takes a mind-boggling amount of time. And it's easy to feel like you always need to be in a hurry. 
you could still be voracious in your learning. I listen to podcasts and audio almost all the time while on the move. I will read what I can, but reading requires you to be focused on what you're doing. And then there's writing, endless amounts of writing about what I'm learning. So this is what I'd say is the tolerance for learning. It's a lot of work. You have to slow down, not speed up. However, it's not necessarily about doing less, but instead about going deeper into the information to cross-pollinate in a way that makes you far more creative, far more open to seeing things in a way that others simply cannot see. But why go so far? So many people take the easiest way possible, the easiest route possible. They say they have no time to read. If you ask them to listen to audio, they say they can't remember anything. And that's not the point of learning. Education comes in layers. I can't remember a lot of what I learn in audio, but if I don't listen to audio, I will miss out on about 300 to 450 hours of education in a single year. So those 300 to 450 hours, that's the amount of time I spend going for a walk every day. So that's the whole year's amount. And that's 450 hours that I won't listen to, I won't learn from. So the tolerance for learning has to be high. Speed is not the answer. Speed reading is more like a TV dinner. It's a quick and deeply unsatisfying experience. You have to slow down, you have to absorb the information, and that's what leads you to a greater level of understanding and success. Tolerance to failure is critical. Tolerance to learning is also extremely vital. But we still have one factor of tolerance that's needed, and that is the tolerance for the long haul. Let's go to the third part and see what this long haul is all about. If you could buy Google for $1.6 million, would you buy it? Google in April 2017 was worth $560 billion. But back in 1997, Google was still a dream in CEO Larry Page's brain. While at Stanford University, he created a search engine. He called it Backrub. He tried to sell that search engine to another search engine company called Excite. But Excite's primary investor made a counteroffer. That was $750,000. And Larry Page thought that Backrub was worth a lot more. So the short story is that today, 20 years later, Google is the most valuable company in the world. 20 years. That's the long haul. And that's a story that is completely different from what you run into on the internet. About a month ago, an ad on Facebook caught my interest. So this person was promising that you could get hundreds of clients and they would sign up to an email list and hundreds of these clients would sign up per day. And usually that kind of bombastic language just bores me to pieces. But on this morning, I was playing around with my watercolors and it seemed like a fun idea to sit through this webinar. The pitch was predictable. The story was how he struggled to make any income at all. And the rags to riches story was how he went from absolutely nothing to several hundred million dollars. And before we know it, this person is hobnobbing with big shots like Sir Richard Branson. So why am I giving you the rundown of this webinar? I'll tell you why. It's because the webinar talks about hard work as the enemy. How we all work hard and how it never changes our life and how this person's seemingly magic system will change everything for you. What he continues to suggest is that you can get the elephant without the poo. And that's the reality that we know is untrue. But we're so often sick and tired of being tethered to a job or even feeling like we should be doing so much better in business that we take the bait. We reject the tolerance for the long haul. We hope somehow that there is a magic pill that will solve our troubles. Larry Page almost took that pill back in 1997. 
he had his reasons, of course, but it's the long haul that has gotten Google to where it is today. So why is this tolerance for the long haul so critical for business? The answer is encapsulated in a single word, drudgery. Let's say you are nuts about coffee, you know the beans, and you're over-obsessed with roasting, and you dream about opening a cafe for coffee snobs. So for the first 50 or 100 days, you're probably running on the aroma of the coffee alone, but then one day you feel like sleeping in. Now, imagine your client showing up to the cafe only to find closed doors. Every business has these days of drudgery. You may adore your work, and you should, but there are days when you simply don't feel like going to work. And ideally, someone should and will step in to help, but the core of the issue is that no matter whether you're Google or the guy selling pipe cream webinars, it's all hard work, and there are days of pure drudgery. And yes, a break helps. You'll get over that drudgery. But if you don't have the tolerance for the long run, you just give up. You'll give up on the podcast series that you started. You'll give up on writing those blog posts. You'll give up when hardly anyone turns up to your workshop because you think you failed. Our membership site at 5000 BC started in 2003. I've personally written over 50,000 posts. Now you divide that by the number of years we've been running the site, and that's around 3,500 posts per year. It includes answers to clients, articles in response to questions, etc. With the courses, I've also finished over 50,000 posts. So when you look at courses like article writing and all those, they go into a separate section, and there are 50,000 posts there as well. So 100,000 posts. When you add the podcast, the books, the workshops, what you have is a long list of stuff that needs to be done, and which I'm happy doing. But if you think that the work stops, it doesn't. William Shakespeare, Pablo Picasso, Hamilton's producer, Jeffrey Seller, Mahatma Gandhi, Leonardo da Vinci, they all realized that they're in the long game. That if you think that you're just getting into a business and the business will run itself, well, that's like buying into a webinar and paying a small fortune to get a magic pill. A magic pill that, for the most part, will be unlikely to work. Because everything involves work which is why you need to get involved in something that you love. I love what I do. I love writing. I love making podcasts. I adore answering thousands of posts in the courses and in 5000 PC. I didn't know what to expect when I joined this business, but I didn't get into this business to simply walk away. I will take my weekends off, and I will take three months off every year. That's the way to get rid of the drudgery. That's my way to come back fresh and rested. But I know that I and you, we both need a tolerance factor. That tolerance factor for the long haul. My niece Kira learned at the tender age of four that you can have an elephant, but it comes with poo. The bigger the elephant, the greater the poo. If you want to build a business... Get the poo tray out, because you're going to need the tolerance for failure. You're going to need the tolerance for learning, and most importantly, for the long haul. These three things, they summarize what we've learned today. Failure is critical. It's going to happen. And the way that you know that you're going to be successful is volume. Picasso and Beethoven and all of the people that have succeeded have volume on their side. And if you're going to do a few things and think, well, this one has to work, well, it doesn't. Even in that interview, you heard the CEO of Hamilton. He was talking about the fact that he didn't know Hamilton was going to work. And yet it did work. And this is the thing about most of us. We don't know what exactly is going to work. So we've got to have that tolerance for failure because around the corner, that's where success is sitting. And success is far less frequent than failure. And that's the first thing that we learned. But the second thing that we learned was that learning needs to slow down.
I always thought I had to speed up learning. And today, if someone were to ask me, what would you rather do? I would say, well, read as much as you can, listen to as much as you can, but then also slow down and cross-pollinate because that makes all the difference to how you learn and what you retain and what you can then reuse. And it's just a different ball game. And finally, it's a long haul. Most of us, we want a magic pill. We want that webinar that will solve our problem. We want that one answer. And even when you're in business, as long as we've been, it's very tempting. I mean, I did go on that webinar. I still have curiosity, have to find out, is there a better way? So we're all tempted. But when you get to that end point, there is only one thing, and that's hard work. And with hard work comes drudgery. And what you've got to do is you have to make sure that you get rid of that drudgery with the breaks. But most importantly, the way out of that drudgery is to do stuff that you love. Because if you don't do stuff that you love, then it's a very, very long month, a very long year, a very long lifetime. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what's happening in psychotactics land? Well, there have been some changes just today. This morning when we woke up, we had a discussion and we went to the cafe and we sat down and we made what we'd consider an important decision. We've been putting off our website for a long time. We've been putting off many projects for a very long time. I've done an entire course on how to write a sales page in less than a day. It's a really good product. I want to write about preacher versus teacher, which is how to do this online learning so that you can really impart your knowledge and make sure that the clients get what you're learning. I want to write a book about talent. All of these things seem to always go to the back burner, and enough is probably enough. So the one thing that does take up a lot of my time is a course like the article writing course. And yes, we were planning to have the article writing course at the end of July, but now there's only the self-study for this year. The article writing course is going to be in 2019. So we're just putting stuff on the back burner, the stuff like the courses for this year. And then next year, we will start up the courses somewhere mid-year or so. But what you will get in the interim period are all of these products that will help you tremendously, like how to write a sales page, how to start the first 50 words of your article, the article writing course will be available, how to create your info product very effectively so that clients keep coming back. All of these things have just sat not done. And I've had to make space and I'm making that space. I will continue to be in 5000 BC because that is where I cross-pollinate my ideas. That's where I learn so much. That's where I answer all those questions and write those articles and where we have these vanishing reports. So I hope you'll join us in 5000 BC because that is never going to stop. 2003, we started 5000 BC. I'm still there 15, 20 times a day. You'll enjoy it there. We'll see you in 5000 BC. One more thing. We still have the cartooning course this year. More details will follow. Keep yourself on that waiting list. Go to psychotactics.com slash da Vinci. The other thing that people ask me is, where do we get our websites done? And we get our websites done at stresslessweb.com. That's stresslessweb.com. This podcast was brought to you by Psychotactics and 5000 BC. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye.